Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Faith Unaltered. I'm your host, David Russell, and I'm joined here by my two wonderful co-hosts, Josh Davidson, the man, the myth, the legend, and Money Metal Dale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a yank, Mr. Russell. Oh, Mr. Russell yeah. How you guys doing? I'm doing great. Uh, on my end, this is, I was telling David behind the scenes, this is a very busy, busy day for me. Uh, oh, no, it's that. Okay. So this is my third podcast today. So I was uh, early, bright and early in the morning. I did my Shroud Wars, three-hour Shroud Wars podcast with um, five panelists, Shroud experts, including uh, Jordan uh, Kareem, who's been on the show, Faith on Alter before and that sort of thing, discussing the carbon dating. Then it uh, in the afternoon, I came on with Dane and uh, Tyler, and Dr. Robert Sun, uh, Sun Jonas, Sun, why can't I say the name? Sun Jonas, is talking about is the uh, Earth the center of the universe and the solar system or not? And uh, now here I am at the request of Mr. Russell to talk about deconstructionalism. Yes, yes. Josh, what's going on, bud? Not a whole lot. Just glad to be off of work. Glad to be off my feet for a couple minutes. Uh, you and, go. you know, ready to ready to dive into some videos and hopefully not laugh as hard as I did last time and try to be a little more nice, but well, we'll guys, see what yeah, yeah. Well, we're definitely going to be going over some more deconstruction videos. These are deconstructors that have now raised objections dealing with the Bible. So um, we're going to respond to some of their, critiques and i'm going to get your guys's opinions obviously so um if you want me to stop the video at any time let me know otherwise i'll stop it when i think you know we should comment or whatever it doesn't matter we can do either or just jump in and tell me to stop the video and we hope that this actually helps because there are so many people going through deconstruction right now it's a big thing um i was just listening to uh the the wor famous worship leader, I think his name was Rhett something, that deconstructed. And there's one thing I notice is that anybody that's deconstructing, they're producing some of the same age-old arguments that have been settled for centuries, sometimes centuries, you know, are common objections that uh, that just really hold no weight when you actually dig into the text, like um, there's some that that will talk about, you know, um, certain verses. And when you just do a common reading, um, um, you'll realize that if you look at the original root word or the, the meaning of the word in, in the original language, there's no contradiction. You know, and to me, that, that kind of says something that there, there was no studying to show yourself approved for one. You know, that there was no uh, uh, deep seatedness to, 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 to get to the truth or there's been some real bad teaching in the church and they weren't getting the answers they needed. So I don't always blame them. And I think some of these are good questions to have, but it's not something that you should depart your faith from. You know, it, it's not something that uh, uh, the answers are out there. And ha seeing the acts they have to grind ha is really galling on me, too, because they, they come up with outlandish claims. And here's the first one. Here's another exciting episode of the stupid shit I used to believe when I was a Christian. The Bible. <laughs> I literally believe that a God, you know, a God had inspired men only men, to write its words in a book and that every word in... All right, so so you're getting the gist oh, of this now. Man. You're getting the gist of this. So the first thing I want to point out is this. Men and only men were inspired Ruth, to write Esther. it. <laughs> What's that? Have you ever heard of Ruth or Esther? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, like, like <laughs> you know, men and only men are inspired. It... it it really brings back like what what is the problem with that like why is that a problem like right why is it a problem i don't think i i don't think a god that is supposed to be all powerful 
that's supposed to be all knowing that is able to work through his creation could wouldn't be much of a god at all if he couldn't use or even inspire men to write his words down it, to me it's like saying are you saying god couldn't do any of those things isn't this kind of like what you uh 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 you know criticize us about um in other instances like god's not you, you know powerful enough to stop evil for example you know right. if he's not powerful enough to 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 stop evil then obviously i guess you're going to think he's not powerful enough to inspire people to write a book what do you guys think go ahead dale, dale. Yep. yeah so yeah i mean there's there's not a lot here i mean obviously there's nothing there's literally nothing of substance it, it's pure just mockery at this point um it, it, you know god even the way he's saying god and all this stuff <laughs> uh learn to speak bro but uh but yeah this basically um Obviously, uh, you know, if I'm being charitable, I'm assuming there's more to it. Like this guy believed in God, now he doesn't. Hopefully, he would have some kind of reason, but there's just nothing presented in the show. It's just pure mockery, and like you said, he's also mocking this idea that God could inspire a book. Um, if God exists, I don't see any anything that's illogical or irrational about supposing that he could inspire men or human beings to write a book of divine revelation um what why is that ridiculous there's nothing so yeah they, there's literally nothing of substance i don't have anything intelligent to say because neither did this guy so yeah uh not trying to be mean but <laughs> maybe god is not god <laughs> yeah yeah very good sean yeah i should have said that <laughs> I, I, I said I was going to try not to laugh as much, but man, this guy broke me <laughs> like immediately. <laughs> that was really funny. Um, I, even though I know that what he's trying to do is be funny, I think he's funny. Not a, like He has a funny delivery, don't get me wrong. If this guy ends up watching this, you're pretty funny, bro. Like That, that was hilarious. But at the same time, I can't take it seriously, and it's not because he's funny. It's because this is dumb. <laughs> like... Not 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 trying to be rude or anything, but like that you're gonna open <laughs> like obviously it's comedy, so it's supposed to be funny, but there's at least supposed to be something being said, right? Like it seems like if I were to come on here and be like, Man, used to be one of those atheists, you believe that? Ha, something from nothing, man, and then left it there. Like I, for like that might be funny. That's fine, but it's not in any way like telling of anything. And if I had something to say, it wasn't contained in that, right? Like it's just the jest. And so maybe that's what he's asking for. Maybe that's what he's aiming at is just to be funny and be silly. Um, I think he could do that without the cussing, but whatever, you know, like that maybe that's his audience prefers that kind of thing. Some people seem to like that. And, every so often in their shows and movies or whatever that's whatever that's their thing but as far as what he said i agree with dale it's like what are you actually trying to get at because saying i used to believe <laughs> one of the, the bible <laughs> you know like and it's like okay well you're not you're not waving like a narnia book you know like you're not waving you know the Grimm's tales or something like that where we would be like yeah this was obviously written as a fiction even when it was written it was a fiction there's this condescension that kind of sweeps underneath and i think a lot of people rhetorically find that compelling because if you talk oh i know i you, you silly you know you silly little children you peons i don't know you know like i i find that like i said it's funny but i don't it, I, don't, I just can't i can't take it seriously all right. Yeah, I just think it's funny uh, to really come at it uh, in in a way that's, you know, A, you're being condescending on purpose. Okay, so we'll, mm -hmm. we'll knock that out of the bag, right? But you're you're attacking a religious belief like that that has been around for thousands of years, you know, at least have a good argument, you know. But let's continue. This book was true, 
real, unchallenged. There were no contradictions in the entire book. It is the word of God. <laughs> By the way, by the way, every religion has a book inspired by their God. What does that say about this book and that God? Or Prove that it. God, or that God, or that God for that. <laughs> you get my point. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I really don't here. Um, the first thing, you know, the word of God has been challenged. You know, I mean, this this claim that, you know, it's been around, it's, it hasn't been challenged, it's supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, without, uh, uh, it's, it's supposed to be perfect, in other words. Well, I mean, that's just not, that's, that's not true. I mean, the Bible has been challenged several times. Now, it stood up to the challenges, I think, every time. Um, like I said, some of these are, are ridiculous. And the, the next claim he makes, which really gets me, is when he's starting to talk about other religions having a word of God, you know, a word, a, a book, you know, written and inspired by their God. I'm not sure about him, but I, ancient Near Eastern cultures, they didn't write. They didn't write. They didn't, you know, the, the Bible's unique in the fact that it's been didactic from the very beginning, right? So this maybe this he's notion, just talking about religions notion. that emerged since Christianity and, and that's Those have books. Yeah. So like, it's kind of like who they actually get them from because you don't see, and this is what I'm talking about, Josh, you don't see didactic teachings to post Christianity, even with these other ancient mystery religions, you know, but in the form, in their ancient form, they weren't, they're either written about a certain God or they were you find them in poems, you know, written on epitaphs or on coffins or on uh, uh, mummies. You know, you don't you don't have didactic teachings from those religions, not until way later. So um, not, I'll let you guys go ahead. But it's not even there are modern religions after the post day Christianity that don't have religious texts. So it's just number one is provably false what this guy says. Right. Like the Native American religions typically don't have written inspired texts or even a, a concept of something like that right so um and there are different other religions have did right christianity islam the abrahamic faith we have a closed canon whereas like buddhists hindus they have an open canon they, they have so many special books and that sort of thing they, no one person can even spend their entire life reading everything that's out there it's just physically impossible so that there are lots of differences out there right um but secondly, let's just grant his premise. Um, okay, every religion has a book. It's what what is his point? That proves nothing. It's a total non sequitur. Does that mean oh well they're all fake? How does that follow? No, I, look, there's one true. There's the way God would do it, and of course I would expect Satan to make counterfeits. Counterfeits prove that there's a genuine kind of thing. So like. You know, that, that's just as logical. I can just assert that, just like him asserting, well, because every religion has a book, therefore they're all false. No, I'll, I'll just say, therefore, one is true, our one, and the rest are all counterfeits. Like, what does he have to say to that? There's no arguments or reasoning. It's just assertion. So fine, I'm going to assert back. Right. Yeah. And I think I think, I think, think the beginning of the video is funnier than the end, but uh, it, to, to continue the same thread, if you were to be like, okay, well, religion is a human universal. So even if they, even if books as an invention never emerged, you would still have like sacred religious transmission of ideas. And before they were books, it was oral traditions and stories, narrative. Like, I don't understand how. How is this supposed to even be discrediting of anything? Like, if anything, the universality of religion and the sacred should be a smack in the face to this guy. Like, it's kind of I, like it's it's on its head. It's screwy. Like, th there's there's literally nothing about religion or sacred text being a universal that has anything to do with whether or not the Bible is trustworthy. If anything, it lends itself to antiquity. It's been like, seriously. Forever. Like we've always, always had human cultures that had sacred narratives about creation accounts, about 
anthropology. Like that's how, that's how we understand the world. It's how we engage with it first. And then that's how we understand one another. It's how we make sense of how I'm supposed to be with you, how you're supposed to be with me, how I relate to everything around me and everything above me. But you know, like what is the, like, I don't even know what this guy thought, like, where did he think that was going to land? Right. And then, you know, if, if it, with, with these, uh, a lot of these other religions that are, are, uh, across different regions, for example, like different pantheons, you know, um, that weren't didactic, you see them all over the place. And you see that that one village would claim that one god was the god of thunder, while the other village would quote the same god and call him a god of war. You know, so they they, they took on different roles depending on the different village or uh, resident or demographic that they were from. Um, and that's one of the things that you know is different than the Bible, which comes at you like. Uh, uh, you know, there existed, you know, during the time of Tiberius, you know, and then it goes and lists uh, places, names and stuff like that to basically say this is what really happened. It's giving you a historical narrative, not a uh, um, a a fictional account or anything of that nature. It's doing its best to record history in that time, you know. So but anything else, guys? <clears throat> Now, I gave you the fun one. I gave you the fun one. These are going to get more serious now. All right, so the next one is going to be uh, uh, a serious claim, and we're going to go through it, okay? Sounds good. Yes, Jimothy. Is it true that there's a recipe in the Bible to force a woman to miscarry? Where on earth did you hear that? I actually read it myself. It's in there. No, Jimothy, you must have read it wrong. It's the ordeal of the bitter water, Miss Jorumpus. Basically, if a woman is suspected of being unfaithful to her husband, they make her drink this thing called a bitter water, and it makes her miscarry. Again, Jimothy, I think you read it wrong. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Where are you reading that from, Jimothy? The Bible. What version? Version? Yes, what version of the Bible are you reading? It says NIV. Oh, okay. See, Jimothy, here we read the KJV, or King James Version. Why are there different versions of the Bible if it's the infallible truth from God? Well, <laughs> and how many versions are there? Um, shouldn't God come down and make sure we all have the correct version so that it's clear for everyone? Well, he... There's 2,800 versions of the Bible? Jimothy, get off your phone. Get out of my classroom. All right, all right, guys. What do you think? We've got the issue of the bitter water. Let's let's tackle yeah. the verse first. Um, yeah. okay. does any, could you, can anybody share their screen for a Bible verse here? Hold on, I'll pull it up. It's Numbers 5, 11 through 22. <clears throat> I think what's funny, um, and I'll go over this first. Uh, we'll do the we'll do the scripture part second. Um, but yeah, Josh, get if you get it up, let me know. Um, but the funny thing is, is that the idea of different Bible versions, right? I mean, mm -hmm. God already came down, right? He came down and he gave us the original language. Right. He, he, he inspired people to write it in their original language. What comes here to me is the fact that there's there's there's. He doesn't know the Bible. He doesn't know where the Bible comes from, how it's made, because there's not th this idea of versions. No, they're actually translations. OK, so it, it, the Bible's only translated twice from the original language to the reciprocal language. All right. Um, and that's how it's done. Any first year Bible scholar is going to be able to tell you that. So these guys that are dedicating like 20 years of their lives to Christianity and then deconstructing and coming back with an argument like this is to me like shows a very big either a, a lack in uh, church teaching or a lack in personal study. You know, 
Um, any first year Bible scholar or student will be able to tell you that, no, this is, it, you know, we have the original and the original language, and then we translate it. So go ahead. Anybody else? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I was just laughing at Jamie because I can get game over, but, but yeah, <laughs> David, so two, two things here that stood out to me. I, I totally agree with you in terms of the Bible version. That's, that's not the issue. It's not like this, uh, what this guy was an ex Christian and he thinks what only the King James version has this trial of jealousy uh, in numbers five. No, I mean, that's, that's in the original Hebrew and all translations will have it. But secondly, is he right about the main point? Is this, somehow immoral, immorally sexist or something like that. Well, no, in the first place, this is um, an ancient Near Eastern, um, sorry, it's a supernatural sign that God used to help women and men. And it, in the first place, we know it applied to both women and to men. So it wasn't just uh, applying to women and that sort of thing. And secondly, there are, there's a big difference, right? Because in the ancient Near East, there were, um, there were trials of ordeal in Babylon and Assyria where it was totally different that, you know, the women were thrown into a, a natural tar pit and of course they, they died. Right. And the reason being the major differences here is that the woman was assumed to be guilty until proven innocent in these pagan cultures. But here it's different. This was a protection for meant as a protection for women who were innocent of the sin of adultery and all that stuff as well as for men who were innocent of this crime. And only God would only apply this supernatural thing uh, if they were guilty of the crime. So this trial actually presupposes they were innocent until proven guilty. Uh, no harm would come to them um, unless they were guilty, which was different uh, than Babylon, right? Where basically because they were presumed guilty until proven innocent, Innocent people were thrown in the tar and they would drown or, or, you know, be taken under and they would die from the fumes and that sort of thing. And secondly, we have to remember, look, this was under the Mosaic law. So it wasn't just enough for a husband to just, oh, I'm going to accuse my wife because I want to get rid of her or something. You have to have at least two to three witnesses to the adultery before this trial would even be initiated. So, yeah, I, I don't see this as being immoral it's certainly not sexist because it did apply to men as well. And um, yeah, in terms of it being immoral, no, this, this was a, a way for them to prove their innocence yeah. and only well, if they were guilty. Did they have to worry about any supernatural like repercussions? So, so if, Dale, what you're saying here, and, and let me just interject here. I, I wanted to finish on the versions, uh, the, the last comment, mm -hmm. um, you know, God doesn't have to make it easy for us. He doesn't have to. He can give us his word, and how we translate it is how we translate it. Um, obviously, I think it's better that way because it it, it 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 makes us participate in this whole thing. You know, it gives us that participation. And for me, I'm not going to say I want God to come down here and do everything for me. You know, he put me on here to grow. He put, you know, I can't grow if you're you're really doing everything for me. So, you know, um, how am I to develop even at that point? I don't know. Um, but Dale, you're right. And, and the fact that this applies to men, it it's, if you notice, if you notice in here and we can go through the entirety of, of the, the text here, um, uh, it says it the, starts in five eleven. it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, any man, if any man's wife go aside and commit trespass against him and a man lie with her carnally. And it be hid from the eyes of the husband and kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witnesses against her, neither she be taken with the manner. Okay. Uh, yeah, there we go. And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy can come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, then shall the man bring his wife in, unto the priest, and he shall bring her uh, offering a, a offering for her, the tenth part of an man, an ipah, a barley meat he shall pour 
Um, no oil upon it, nor frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy. So, um, where is it? Where does it get into the specific spot, Josh? Uh, Sean, I'm also talking about Numbers five twelve is is where it gets into the um, into the trial of bitter waters. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. No, that says no. Okay. I 12, was, uh, 12 is the beginning of the passage. Yeah. It actually gives the conclusion later on because it says the priest take holy water and it describes the making of the bitter water. What we're doing is giving the context of why the bitter water is used and what is the method. Yeah. It says in his hand, the bitter water that, that causeth the curse, they shall charge her by an oath. Uh, if you have gone aside and he gives her the rights, right? And then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath, the oath among the people, the Lord, and that it caused your your thigh to rot and your belly to swell and the ca curse cause your belly to swell thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, amen, amen. Right. And so she agrees to this, right. And the yeah. waters become bitter and they become a poison under her. So the, yeah. I, I think, I think the reason, the reason why you have something like this emerging in scripture. And by the way, this is not the first and only, or this is the first, but this is not the only time in scripture where it warns us if something is ingested, and you are unclean before it because of its ingestion, it'll actually cause ailment or death, which is actually the Eucharist as well. Paul says many have become sick or even fallen asleep because they did not discern the body when they were taking the 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 bread and the wine among the the believers in the New Testament as well. And so I think the crucial part of this actually is the fact that what they're doing is obeying God and bringing something before him when this is the the thing right here there be no witnesses against her right no one can say because that was a big that was a big part of the the law at the time was witnesses and being able to establish not just on hearsay but actually establish something that somebody was being charged with you could not establish this and it was merely off the intuition or jealousy of the husband or wife or whatever that are charging their spouse with infidelity and there's no proof there's no evidence there's no witness there's just the hunch or the inclination to think so and so they had to leave that unseen crime up to, let's say, an unseen uh, judiciary with an unseen treatment. And it all seems very appropriate to me if what they're doing is actually believing that God's going to handle the situation as he does. Right. And that's going to be something that is completely out of their hands. So what they're doing is handing over that jurisdiction to God to deal with the unseen things because there's no, there's nothing, there was no recourse on our end, on the judiciary's end or the husband's end. There's no witness against her, right? And that's, I think, the crucial part of why this is the way that it is. It would be something that you ingest and kind of, you know, leave up to how God is going to deal with it. So, uh, per Aspera at Astra asks, so abortion after infidelity is okay, but modern abortion due to rape and incest is not. See, this is the problem is this is not about uh, 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 abortion at all. There's no mention that she's pregnant within the verse at all. This is one of the the mistakes behind in the the interpretation of this passage, right? Is that this is uh, uh, has to deal with a pregnant woman, but it, there's no suggestion that there's pregnancy at all. Matter of uh, fact, if you look at what this bitter uh, waters uh, uh, is is made with, is there's nothing no poison to cause an abortion or a miscarriage. Okay, so when you look at the the terms that are actually used here in the original he Hebrew, okay, and that's one of the things I was saying, Sean, is that, uh, yeah, you're right, we don't have uh, the original pen manuscripts, but we have the copies in the original language. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm getting at here is the term Yarik is the actual one that's used in here to describe uh, 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 the, the, the curse, right? One of the, one of the words is Yarik, which means the thigh, right? And that's why I'm glad Josh brought up that, that uh, version of the Bible, because it does say thigh versus uh, um, um, the, the stomach or whatever, right? Because, um, it, it has nothing to do with the uh, the womb, 
That's what it is, the womb. It has nothing to do with the womb. It has more to do with the thigh. Matter of fact, and you can cross-reference that to the same thing that happened to Jacob when the uh, the angel touched his thigh and had him cause a limp. It's the same exact uh, wording, which is wrong. I mean, the NIV got it wrong when it used womb here because uh, that, that does give a idea of, yeah, like this could mean pregnancy, but it doesn't. Um, it also applies to the male as well. Um, so the, the thing is, the thing is, is that, um, the, uh, the point is there's divine judgment here, right? There's divine judgment, which really like is crazy to me because if God does judge somebody, then you're a deconstructionist or you're atheist, they scream bloody murder. But then when God doesn't do it, then they scream bloody murder again. So it's like, do you, when is it okay for God to judge his people? And by what method is he allowed to do that with? Okay, so you have a direct case where uh, God God does judge. And they're a curse to the people. So again, you're not having a pregnancy here. This has nothing to do with pregnancy. And the original language, by using the term like Yarek, is uh is very telling also um um you see nepal use here too which literally means rot so it makes it makes more sense and not only that but again we know what the 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 bitter the 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 concoction that was made was made with there was no poison it's a supernatural judgment so Last phrase is how how is it not dealing with pregnancy because of what I just read in the original language? Because um, it's dealing specifically with yeah. infidelity. Yeah, the woman could be pregnant or not pregnant, and in yeah. fact, I think the entailment of what he was talking about as the curse, which could in fact be, let's say, a, a permanent fixture upon her body that she would now be barren rather than assuming that she's actually with child presently is that she wouldn't be able to carry, which would have been a drastic dishonor to any woman in that society to become barren. It was something that, that something that would have been a huge, like, like almost a, a social demoting. You know what I mean? When a woman oh, yeah. couldn't bear children, she was seen as less than the other women. Uh, and so that's, that's something that would be a huge deterrent alone. Just the fact that this is something that they would, they would have believed that this is exactly what would have happened. If you were guilty, God would deal with you, especially because you just took an oath with a priest before, you know, before your, your, your priest and, or the, the priest and your husband and you, you know what I mean? Like this is a contractual thing where you're handing yourself over to God to be judged. And yep. it would be a fearful thing to be handed over to God to be judged. And so yep. they would not, let's say, went the, it would be a deterrent enough to not willfully undergo this oath. If you knew you had been guilty, confession would be a better thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, and this is one thing you'll also see as we go to the next video. Uh, there's going to be uh, times where, where you have to understand that these laws are, just, are a lot like ours today, even. Um, they're, they're guidelines. They're didactic. Again, they're didactic. That's a big word that, that people really need to understand. They're didactic. They're set as guidelines. Okay. Everything in the case usually has to be considered, right? Uh, and, and judgments can range within the minimum and maximum penalty like we do today. We have the minimum penalty of, of, of when you break the law, and then you have the maximum penalty that the judge can give you, right? So um, this also doesn't deal with pregnancy for the simple fact it doesn't say pregnancy in here at all. It's absent from the text. And if somebody got thigh rot, <laughs> they're going to smell. And it's they're going to be it's going to it's going to show it's there's no way to hide forever. it. It's a yeah, it, there's no way to hide it. So they're going to be known as a person that lied and was judged by God. So, yeah, it's not. I, and and unfortunately, the NIV does have a bad translation on this uh, when it when it translates Yarek to womb instead of thigh, which I don't know how they miss that, considering Yarek is used when it comes to the thigh in so many different uh, uh, texts and the context is is even doesn't even mention pregnancy so i don't know how they got it uh wrong in that that aspect but we never claim that uh, uh our translations are without uh 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 
you know, variants are errors or anything, you know, so that's what, that's another claim. Um, but anyways, uh, Dale, you got anything to say before we wrap this one up? Yeah, you guys all pretty much uh, took the words out of my mouth, but just one quick response to per aspera here. So it seems a lot like witch trials. What was the punishment for man's infidelity? Well, it would be the same, first of all, for the man, right? And Paul Copen in his book has got a moral monster conclusively demonstrates this in terms of its context. So it did apply both to men and women. But um, in terms of it seeming like a witch trial, so it, all I would say is you, you've got an assumption there. So it, yes, it does seem like a witch, a witch trial, right? I guess you could say that. But is it actually akin to the witch trials? They're totally disanalogous here. We can, you can't just beg the question that God doesn't exist or the God of Israel is a false God. This was a, is supposed, is claiming to be a supernatural real trial and god knows whether they're guilty or not it's it's nothing like the salem witch trials where human beings were totally in error and making erroneous judgments about people and stuff like that no this is god that's doing the judging and making a supernatural judgment according to the claim now you can deny that claim obviously you're not a believer we can debate whether god exists and whether the god of israel is true or not but at least evaluate it on the claim right uh, the claim is, no, God, God is real, um, and that this is a real supernatural trial where a just judgment is being made. Um, it's not the Salem witch trials where it's like, oh, you've got a pimple, you must be from Satan. Like, come on. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's a difference there. That's the only thing I would say. <laughs> all righty, all righty. Josh. Yeah, Josh is laughing. All right, I'm guys. Trying so not to laugh so one, much, but it's pretty funny. It's and we're gonna funny. try to. I'm gonna try to hit all these verses for you guys. Um, so we're gonna. Uh, um, some of the stuff we already talked about here is gonna also bleed over into that because there there's some claims in here. So um, let's get after this one, and then we'll open the floor. It says that none of us are good. Hmm. The Bible also says that women aren't allowed to speak in church. All right. That's the first one. Women aren't allowed to speak in church. Dale, I know you got some uh, egalitarian stuff here for this one. Uh, yes, they are. I mean, we have explicit examples in the Bible. And I don't know why she's putting up Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus is the Old Testament. There's no church at that time. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, you can speak in church women were able to prophesy in church. We even have an example of a woman with the highest authority. Uh, Junia, we, I mean, Paul gives us four examples of uh, leadership within a church, one led by a man, one led by a man and a woman, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, um, one led by a woman, and um, one led by a committee of three, for example. So, yes, women can and were expected to speak in churches. Um, I know me and David, we're going to have some disputes on, but can they speak as a pastor there's debate about that i i would say yes they could um but nonetheless regardless of of that issue about preachers there's no question women were allowed to speak and verbally express themselves in churches um yeah this is more that verse is more about a military discipline in the church right women weren't expected to be dinged at idiots gossiping in the corner no like the men shut up sit down Listen to the word of God from the preacher. You are made in the image of God. You have a brain in that little noggin, just like men do. You are <laughs> supposed to, you're supposed to learn. We're, there's neither male nor female. We want to hear the word of God. So uh, this is kind of against women going and saying, well, we're just <laughs> women. This isn't for us. Let's go gossip about our neighbors in the corner. No, sit down like the men and listen to the preacher preach the word of God. You've got a brain. You listen and learn just like the men. That's what this verse is saying, in my opinion. Right. And, um, you know, other verses related to this. I don't know if that if she actually. The Bible also says that. I don't know what else. Uh, I don't I don't know why she put Leviticus up. That does kind of doesn't make sense. But if you I, I look... feel like that's probably there from a previous clip and she had this like she cut two yeah. videos. Must have must have been. But like uh, I thought it said second Tim, uh, the second Timothy on there. Um, but silence is a common command for anybody that's disruptive. Okay, uh, we know that at least in 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 the 
in the idea that Paul's getting at is that there was a lot of disruption going on in Ephesus, you know, um, because, I mean, the church was in the same quarter as like the Dionysus cult and a a bunch of other uh, um, various churches where people would would yell and stuff like that and, and, you know, talk, you know, but it's more of a dis, the command always and even in like, uh, you get first Corinthians 14, um, tongue speakers are also to keep quiet. You know what I mean? The people speak in the tongues, right? So, right. I mean, it, there's always a uh, discipline that needs to be exercised, right? So, um, the only thing I would disagree with, uh, Dale in is that I don't think, you know, that, that the women were to have a judicial authority over men. And I think that's for very practical, practical purposes. And that's, and that's where I get the idea of elder and stuff like that, you know, um, why it's specifically given to male roles. Uh, but as far as speaking, I agree with Dale on that. Women are, uh, speaking in church. Uh, Timothy was also to, uh, you know, greet Priscilla and Aquila, you know, both husband and wife team there. Um, and give them the the respect they deserve and stuff like that. So um, to say that women are supposed to be totally silent in church, and that's just something that comes along, uh, um, you know, with the misunderstanding of of the text there. And unfortunately, I think the church has done a bad job in that area, of, you know, when it comes to allowing women to, you know, speak more in the church. But Josh. I, and, and also, as I understand it, and I, I'm willing to be corrected on this, but from what, what I understand, the way that they had things set up in the early church at this time while this was taking place would have been similar to the synagogues in which the people were divided into appropriated areas of the room and the men and the women would not be immediately next to each other. Even a married couple, the women would go with the women and the men would go with the men. And this was a division of the room. And so it would have been very disruptive if women were taught you need to speak with your husband so your husband will speak to the 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 leader. And this is the pecking order of how questions and things that were, let's say, misunderstandings. I don't understand. I need clarity on this thing. You can't be calling across the room and disrupting what's going on with motion and voice to ask your husband to ask the 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 leader what's going on with this or that teaching. And so it's, I think it's similar, practically speaking to how speakers nowadays will say, we're saving questions until the end or hold your applause until the end, something like that, where if you say be silenced, it sounds a little more derogatory and commanding. And so we're, we're, we're carefully mannered now, but the same kind of commands are used in public speaking engagements all the time. Hold your applause until the end. We'll take questions at the end. And then you tell people in a very nice way, the same thing. Don't be a disruption. You know what I mean? And it's not necessarily that there won't be a place or an appropriate time or space for people to communicate in that way. It's the fact that this is not the time it's inappropriate. You know what I mean? Right. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, are you done, Josh? Are you, you still? No, no, you're good. Been- Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just about to say, yeah. And then, then there's also some uh, uh, misunderstanding, I think, of the actual terminology being used in these different passages. Like a lot of times it will say you or uh, uh, um, it, it will use what we would think today as like a, a singular uh, um, address when in actuality, if you go back in the context, you'll see that when he's saying you, it's already in the context of like brothers and sisters, right? So like it's addressing everybody. And the word in Greek uh, is also used a lot is anthropos, which is mankind instead of Andreas, which is just men, right? So when you look at these and you put them together, Timothy probably, uh, probably wouldn't have understood this in a gender specific way, right? He would have understood this as a, uh, um, as a command of like, Hey, look, tell people to quiet down. If you're preaching, don't let them, you know, over speak you or this and that keep them silent. Um, because there is a disruption that's going on, obviously, and he's addressing it and we have to read the Bible in light of its cultural context. That's so important to understand because those, these letters aren't written to us. They're written for us. 
okay, they're written to the church of Ephesus or Timothy or uh, the Corinthians, uh, you know, or the Corinthians, right? They're not meant, they're not doing it to, to us, you know? Um, so yeah, there's, there's that too. So, um, as we go through this, you're going to see a lot more of it. So let's, let's continue. Uh, people with disabilities cannot approach God. The there, there, there it went. Okay. So yeah, the first one was first, first Timothy two twelve, And the second one, uh, about abilities cannot approach God. People with disabilities cannot approach God. Dale? You're muted, Dale. Okay, Josh, anything on this? Disabilities are not allowed to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, let Josh go yep. I I actually pulled I, I pulled the text up right here. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it on screen so we can talk about this sensibly. Um, it was verse Le oh, Leviticus 21. Okay, hold on. Mm -hmm. My dyslexia is appearing. There we go. And what was it? Verse 16? Yep. 16 okay. through 21. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations, that he have any blemish, let him not approach the offer approach to offer the bread of his God. So this is serving in the priesthood is the context here, not merely approaching God. And so that was a conflation off top, which was very either uncharitable or dishonest to say people can't approach God if they have disabilities. No, they couldn't serve in the priesthood of the temple of Israel or in the tabernacle, in the Levitical priesthood, right? Mm -hmm. what, whatsoever he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame, or he has a flat nose or anything superfluous, a man that is broken footed, broken handed, crooked backed, a dwarf, he has a blemish in his eye or scurvy or is stabbed, has stones, has his stones broken. So even a person who has an injury to their own testicles that makes them incapable of birthing uh, or, or uh, um, uh, let's say uh, begetting, right? This person is not going to be uh, part of the, the priesthood in the scripture. Um, ultimately here, I'll pull that. Sorry. I, I thought I pulled this up. Oh, sorry. Um, so what we have here is specifically, um, to approach, to offer the bread of his God. That's the opening portion of this passage here. And so the reason for this ultimately is actually imagistic more than it is legal. And what it is to, to represent is the tabernacle was modeled after the heavenly tabernacle to which Moses was given the pattern that he would make on earth that which was represented in heaven. In heaven, those aff affirmities and maladies are not present. And so the tabernacle being a earthly representation of a heavenly reality was to be a reaction or a representation of that heavenly reality in the best capacity that it could be. And so those maladies and those uh, deficiencies, those deformations, those injuries were not present in the heavenly tabernacle and therefore are not present in the earthly tabernacle, period. Yeah. So, I mean, the disabled aren't doomed, right? Uh, this is uh, right. even look at the lamb. OK, the lamb had to be spotless as well. Um, it, and, and it was for that symbolism. I'm sorry. There's certain qualifications for jobs and there's certain qualifications that, that go into almost anything we have in life, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there is this idea that, you know, these guys can't serve as high, pr the, the high priest that walks in the Holy of Holies. Now, can he do other tasks around the tabernacle or whatever? Yes. He's just not going to be the one going in to do that because of the symbolism that is involved. You know, it's no, no slight. It, it doesn't say that the disabled are doomed and they can't come before the throne of God and receive forgiveness. That's not what it's saying at all. Um, Dale. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was just sending you as a private thing. I, I got something I got to take care of. Uh, I will come back as soon as I can, though. So, like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, maybe. Okay. But all right. I, I all agree right. with what you guys are saying on this this thing for sure. So, yeah, I'll be back. All right. All right. On to the next. The Bible also says to stone women who aren't virgins when they get married. The Bible... All right. Was that? All right. Let's wrap because she goes by this fact. God. The Bible also says to stone women. 
and who aren't virgins when they get so josh women yeah. are to be stoned if they're not virgins what do you think so I still, what she's talking about yeah. right here i pulled it up again if any man take a wife and go into her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her wait a minute hold on she said what was it third third no wait hold on sorry the bible also says oh. to take your disobedient children out to the 18, streets and let all sorry. the neighbors stone them to death i'm i'm in the wrong my dyslexia again there and i women am women who aren't virgins when they get married the bible also trying to keep up with so many numbers at a time so fun okay sit where was it oh yeah so this is the hard thing about going through these uh texts is that like she's she's going off so fast 13 but yeah so basically someone doesn't understand the ancient near eastern culture and that's one of the biggest things is the cultural context right so in the culture at this time you know um abusive husbands could pr were running rampant all throughout the 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 ancient Near East. This is actually protects them. A matter of fact, the law again is not a didactic. So this is a guideline here. It also takes into consideration that being able to 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 uh, uh, to prove that she was a virgin, a virgin, is uh, um, um, easy, very easy to do. It could be faked, and you could never prove otherwise. It could be uh, the fact that she. Maybe she didn't have a hymen. She didn't bleed at all because a lot of girls don't bleed when the, when that happens. So it, it, it's really uh, uh, a stint to for abusive and greedy husbands to um, not be able to bring this charge against a woman once they marry her because a lot of times uh, a dowry would be paid, right? And if the person was trying to get more honor or you know or or more money they could bring this accusation forth, right? And not only that, but it would also uh, it also makes it so that the husband can't accuse the wife directly. So it leaves the the woman he married out of the accusation and makes it so you're accusing her parents, which now you're bringing dishonor upon her family. So now it's you're blowing it up into a bigger issue. So it's really a protection clause in, in this law here. Um, that um, um, would would also it would also keep a deceitful woman from trying to uh, uh, dishonor her family as well. So, um, Josh, you got anything else? Not not really. I'm trying to read over the passage uh, and listen at the same time. But in in what she's what what she's pointing out seems to be something that's entirely cultural and is something to do with the way that God was granting purity laws to the people and virtually all of the purity laws ended with and then they would be stoned right like, yeah so well, I'm, I'm the kind thing. Of... So, so like uh this is what last Friday says everything is literally interpreted until it's inconvenient then it just becomes a guideline that's not true the thing is, is we don't understand an ancient Near Eastern context, so we have to read it in light of that context. And in light of that context, just like we have today, we have laws that, that bear a minimum and maximum penalty, okay? And they are to be used as guidelines. They are to be didactic. And this is the common way to understand this. It's not that it's an inconvenient, and, and the fact is you need to interpret things um, as the literature demands, not as we want to. You can't uh, uh, say Jesus is a loaf of bread because he says I'm the bread of life. It you know you have to know th what you're reading and process it that way. Um, but yeah, um, another question from um, Paraspera: um, Virginity tests have been debunked. Not all virgins uh, enact him hymens are intact hymens and do not all versions bleed yeah i just I, I just stated that do i think any innocent girl was stoned during these tests um as far as biblically we have no recorded record of uh that actually happening so um again which would also attest to this being an actual guideline because like like i said before these tests were easily 
able to be faked, right? So it, it's really to stop abusive husbands from bringing this uh, um, act because in, a, in the ancient times, family is very important because it kept the community going. It was tight knit because, you know, uh, most people didn't even travel seven miles uh, outside of their own community their entire life at this point. So we have a lot of, of um, these laws are based off of the context they found themselves in, you know, the culture they found themselves in. So family was a very uh, a tight knit group that, um, um, you, you know, to, to leave not only that, but to divorce a woman would leave her destitute. Um, so it, 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 it curbed divorce rates. Um, and it encouraged the growth of the community is what I'm trying to say. So overall, um, this, like I said, this law is actually to protect a woman more than it does to help a male in any way. And compared to the other laws in the surrounding areas, uh, like Dakota Hammurabi, this is like absolutely different. <laughs> so anything else, Josh? No, not really. I, I like historically speaking, I wouldn't have much to add that you already didn't say. But it was just interesting that as I kept reading, um, I noticed that this was this this is the same chapter in which we get a response to what happens if a a, a man uh, is is found to be unfaithful, and it actually says if a man is found lying with a woman married to another to a husband, then they b shall both of them die. So it's like I to find the fact that in smaller sized communities the best deterrent for any moral infraction is the heaviest sentence. That's the warning. That doesn't mean that every time something happened, it was always executed as that form of judgment. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't think that it's even reasonable to assume that every single time a crime was brought forth, like let's say a, a son disrespected his father one time, did the parents immediately hand them over to the elders to take him outside the city and be stoned? Or did the parents have the jurisdiction of their own to be merciful on their children? It's like, I, I just, I think we have such an assumption because of the words in the text that have to be an extreme, because that's usually how you would lay out uh, a, a, a parameter or a law is you start from the extreme and then you move toward the idiosyncratic yep. based on the case, right? You do that today. Exactly. And so when you write laws, you're, especially if the law itself is going to entail the punishment that would be due someone in this case, then you would give the harshest punishment possible. We have communities that are so large now that often things like this are actually just found to be unnecessary. But let's say you have a smaller community and there's nothing to deter people from from the 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 crimes that they're committing. You ultimately do use something that's the harshest punishment possible, right? So it's like stealing nowadays, if you had a culture back then that you need to make sure that this person who was marked for stealing is not going to do it again, they would cut off their hand. Nowadays, you put handcuffs around them and you put them in a room and you punish them by taking their time away and and inconveniencing their lives and putting them in debt and all kinds of other things we we do all kinds of damage in different ways now but we think we're more civilized because we take a different approach to the same problem but we're also not dealing with the same problems not by a long stretch and so i think oftentimes we're offended because of our our context because somebody else had a different context. Those people probably would have looked at us and been like, how do you even live with, an, with no order whatsoever comparatively, right? There was so much that was like, we're so convenienced and spoiled in our brains that we think this sort of way, especially as Americans were afforded rights and privileges from birth that most communities around the world had never seen ever. And so right. I think we just, we have a very weird way of approaching history. We do. And and um, one thing um, Sean, Sean says is there's a saying in the Talmud that if the Sanhedrin gave the death penalty more than once every seven years, they were said to be bloodthirsty. And that's true. Um, and, you know, they were also called blind guides by Jesus, you know. Um, and what did Jesus do when the woman was caught in adultery? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, the same Jesus. The yeah. If And again, if Christianity is true, Jesus is the same God that gave the revelation to Moses to bring about the law. 
So if right. Jesus is the same God that gave Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and Jesus shows up and says, this is how I deal with things, then obviously we have to live within the paradoxical exchange of those two ideas and allow for the fact that mercy is actually God's prerogative. And it seems like reconciliation and healing are God's primary method of dealing with anything. Last Fry, this uh, this comment here, yeah, it's not inspired text, but it's a historical text. And we can glean from history how things were actually practiced, right? So this proves our point that these are guidelines that explain an extreme maximum and a uh, – um, um, and a minimal uh, sentence, right? So um, I don't think, uh, Paraspera, again, I don't think any of this justifies stoning somebody. Well, I mean, there's a lot of laws you can agree and disagree with, okay? That's fine. A lot of these laws also were uh, civil laws that applied to this time period that weren't meant to be applied later on. Women who aren't virgins when they get married. The Bible also says to take your disobedient children out to the streets and let all the neighbors stone them to death. I literally just mentioned that before yeah. she did. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead. Any more on that part? I look as a parent. I find the fact that when I was growing up, I had friends who not only disrespected their parents, but verbally and sometimes physically abused them. We have come so far in the opposite direction from this as a society. We have things like jerry springer and maury and all these daytime tv shows that have been going on since i was a kid that show some of the most absurd examples of how crazy people can get and we look at something like this with the stark contrast that it has and again we're very confused and our first assumption which is very weird is that Every single time a case like this would happen, the parents would simply go along with it and hand their children over to a death sentence. I don't know about you guys, but no. This is obviously talking about the extreme end of a problem. So the problem would come to an extreme end. And I just, I like, I think it's it's one of those things where you're like, really, do you, I, the, the ancient world is different, but they're not dumb. Right. Like they're not dumb. I, I think I think we often look at a world that was older and different and we don't realize the vast genius that would have been necessary to survive a year. In those conditions, you know I mean? yeah. like they had they needed each other. It would be yeah. preposterous to well, think if, that every single time your children were disrespectful in any capacity, that you simply drag them out into the streets and have them slaughtered by your neighbors. That's yeah. nuts to me. But here's the thing is, is not only that, but it includes the neighbors, right? It includes the neighbors. And if you look at this law carefully, you'll see that it talks about um, how could just a disobedient child uh, be a threat to destroy the nation? Because it talks about that. It talks about like them destroying the nation because of their disobedience, right? So what crime actually are they committing here? There's obviously more to this than just your kids being disobedient no this is treasonous stuff <laughs> this stuff is is when uh you're being a threat to the entire community not just a kid that mouths off to his his son or his dad or disrespects his parent no look into the text the text is telling you that that the the crime of of what this guy's doing is is threatening the 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 viability and the health of the actual nation so there's this this crime is it goes a lot deeper, right? So um, and, and there is some historical um, notations that I had that I can't find right now, but it was uh, on the type of disobedience uh, being um, having to do with like espionage and stuff like that, or treason, like you said, yeah. or mm -hmm. war crimes, or treachery, or a plot for some sort of rebellion. Right. Like and here's the thing is, is the people of Israel were a people of covenant as well. And so that was part of their day to day understanding of what their community was, what family was, what every like their entire lives were informed by the fact that they were a covenant people under God and that all of their their blessings or or let's say their fate as a culture was tied to that covenant. So everyone in the covenant 
was just as relevant as everyone else to the covenant. And that's why they were treated as a corporate people. And so Israel was getting warnings about how God was going to deal with them. When the sons of Israel became disobedient, he did deal with them in judgment. And they did get dealt with in corporate, uh, in a corporate way. They mm -hmm. all together received the same kind of punishment when the entire nation was brought down. And usually that happened because of individuals. And that spread because that's what sin does. It spreads and it spreads like a contagion, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you had the first zombie outbreak, the first zombie would die rather than having it spread everywhere, right? Right. They play with this conundrum in, in modern zombie movies all the time. A person is bit. Everybody in the group knows it. They have no cure. They know it's a matter of probably a few hours before this person kicks and comes back. And it's a problem. And now you have the deliberation among everybody in the community, whatever it is that's left of it. They have to they have to decide for themselves and discern the situation to say, does this person who has the contagion survive until it's spread or is it dealt with now? That's not an identical situation, but it's the same kind of situation as what we're trying to describe within the, the setting of a covenant and the spreading of sin. You have to understand, again, what David, David was saying. This is the conceiving of how these people perceived the world and how they interacted with it. This was their world. Sin was death and contagion. Yep. And to allow sin to exist would bring death and contagion, Right. sometimes literally. Yep. And not only that, but it would it would also uh, uh, um, impact the community in different ways. Right. Because it could totally erase family lines if you just, you know, hiccup wrong almost in those type of days. You know, uh, a, a small cut on you would, you know, because of the hygiene at that time. I mean, a small cut could end your life. <laughs> you know, um, I was uh, just. Uh, there's some missionaries of Papua New Guinea not too long ago, and uh, a female was uh, hacking through some um, um, some stalks in her village and came down and cut her thumb almost clearly off. It damaged it so bad that like the bones were all cracked and messed up, and oh, her man. family treated it as a death sentence. They came to her house, um, said their goodbyes, and it was foregone conclusion. She was going to die. If it wasn't for those missionaries that bound her up and then flew her out into uh, uh, Sydney, Australia, or wherever the city city was that was closest to them, she would have died there, you know? So, you know, a harsh environment, you know, and some of these laws are to prevent harsh things from happening to the people. And, you know, that's the, one of the biggest things we don't take into consideration. We read these with 20th century eyes and don't take into consideration all the nuances that went into creating a society in those harsh conditions. The Bible also says that if two men are fighting and one of their wives sees it happening and goes to defend her husband, she's to have her hand cut off. And here's a, another one. Um, this is specifically... A woman that runs up to the guy that that's fighting with her husband and grabs the guy's jewels and basically stops him from reproducing like she wounds him. Um, that's not like helping your husband. No, there's something more going on there that you're trying to do. You're trying to end this man's family line, which is very important to this to the culture there. So that's seen as a crime. It's not like you're just defending your husband here. Um, uh, and, and, and her punishment, her punishment isn't death per se. Again, um, it was probably a eye for an eye type thing. You know, um, it would they wouldn't kill her. Um, it, it's probably better translated, uh, was meant to cut her, uh, uh, um, her, her lower extremities hair, right. To mark her as a woman that couldn't be or wasn't allowed to reproduce herself at that point because just to stone her for wounding the man even though that wound is pretty detrimental to that society it would actually violate the eye for an eye clause so when you read and you translate this it's probably more a punishment that would 
not would forbid her from reproducing. And that would be the visible sign. Josh? Oh, you pretty much got it. All right. Yeah, I was I was gonna say the same. I'm back now, but um Yay. Thank okay. you, David. Yep. <laughs> yeah, David David covered all the bases, so all right. The Bible well also done, says David. that without the shedding of blood, God can't forgive sin. The Bible also says So the shedding of blood, God can't forgive sin. I know Josh is just reeling on this one. Go ahead, buddy. Look, Hebrews is my favorite book in the Bible. But <laughs> Um, okay, the context of Hebrews, when he says that, is the explanation of why Christ is the fulfillment and superior agent to all elements of the Old Covenant. That is literally the purpose of the book of Hebrews, is to consider the supremacy of Christ over this, over that, over this, over that, the fulfillment, and then to establish that Christ is our high priest and doing all these things, which is why they had sacrifices that entail that that involved blood in the old testament to begin with was that this was in if if you're following the narrative that's being granted by hebrews it was actually a foreshadowing of what god was going to do in finality right and so and and also it's entirely reasonable to translate that text as there will be no forgiveness of sin without the applying of blood but that's a completely different argument but either way if God has the prerogative that says, without the seriousness of mortal wound, you will not have forgiveness of mortal sin. That's God's prerogative. And our uncomfortableness with it is really rather arbitrary and silly. And I don't know that that actually amounts to anything other than I don't like it. But even more specifically, if the blood that God is pleased to forgive by is his own blood how much less should you be complaining about it isn't that the highest form of taking responsibility for that prerogative god offered his own blood and not simply said you the guy that everyone likes the least you die he said no i'll hand my life over willingly and the blood he's referencing is in fact his own i think that that is missed on a lot of people, even people who are believers often kind of miss this, is the blood that God is talking about is his blood. It is his blood that was offered and is applied for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what I would say. Yep, I I totally agree. And, you know, people, I've said this on the show before about like, why, why is it blood? Why is, you know, God, it's not like God is just arbitrarily demanding a blood sacrifice or something like that just arbitrarily as though hey it's either oranges or your blood i'm going for your blood no it, <laughs> blood is necessarily symbolic of life and what what is the necessary consequence of sin death right separate relational separation from god and physical death separation of body and soul this is a necessary and inevitable consequence of this having this sin disease it is the necessary symptom and result of it so in order to save us god had to shed his blood he had to suffer the necessary consequence and be punished by dying so that's what hebrews 9 is saying there that death is required right the, that blood symbolic of death uh that punishment had to be paid but thankfully jesus was is willing to pay that on our behalf it's one of the most amazing acts of love in human history it is the ultimate act of human love in human uh, history there so sorry of love in human history so yeah that's that's my take on hebrews 9 again it, it went by so fast so i don't know exactly what her objection was but that's my general take on on that right and i do want to back up a, a second because uh the last fry put it here sarcastically i think it's kind of funny no crotch kicks <laughs> um the funny thing about that i did have something to say about crotch kicks uh this is not a, a a thing where you know the woman's defending and just goes off and kicks the guy in self-defense no this is her like singling out his jewels and squeezing them to where it causes him specifically to have a rupture. a rupture. So that's the, the language that is actually employed. It's not about a self-defense kick. So I did want to make that clear. 
but let's let's continue to walk up to neighboring cities that don't belong to the nations nearby and to either enslave them or kill them all and then take the women and children as plunder all right so we got some plunder going on here who wants well, to go you first go, Dale? you go first david because this is this is a problem of evil uh uh quote all over it oh gosh no i you know it, it's it's so funny is that you know we judge people all the time right um we judge people due to their actions okay um, we put them in jail. We take basically their lives away, <laughs> basically any type of freedom that they have when God does it, or he uses agents to do it. People are in an uproar, right? But when he doesn't do anything, they get all bent out of shape as well. To me, the, the Canaanites here, this whole Canaanite issue, the Canaanites were so bad that God said, I'm done. You know, we're looking at the God that, that says, I would save a city if there's just 10 righteous people in it. Just 10, right? Then you can't find 10, but there's one family that's righteous in it. And he still gets them out of the city. And the wife was not one of them because she looked back. But he still got the ones that were righteous out of the city. So he still protected the good within this is the same god okay so if 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 it comes time for god to actually judge evil and wickedness what is the big deal you know um he, not only that he shows mercy because she's they're plunder the kids are plundered no they're incorporated into the society mm -hmm. they have status within the society which is um, a covenantal society that which is, is a covenant for society. their obedience exactly and it's a mercy they're shown to the women and to the children there. Exactly. Um, um, and these people were, I'm sorry, were, they're at war with Israel. There is a war going on. What, what mercy that is being shown to the, to, the, to, the, to the women and children that wouldn't be able to take care of themselves without a father around, then Israel incorporating them into their society. That's mercy, man. So the fact that they're at war to begin with, and then they're 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 being merciful by taking these families in, to me says a lot. So I, why is this an objection? I don't know because God's damned if He does and damned if He doesn't. Because you know? outside the context of an ancient war, you you don't really see why it would be the case that capturing a neighboring land and taking their women and children into your community would actually be a positive benefit. Because right. if you if you wrench it out of its context, you can do this kind of reductionism where it's, oh, well, God's doing this and they said this. And oh, obviously God, you know, likes, you know, uh, a Viking activity of pillaging and raping and we should all just become holy pirates. <laughs> Dale? I don't know what to say. You guys kind of said everything already, right? So, yeah, it's in an ancient war context. Um, so this is an act of mercy for the, the women. They're not treated as plunder. Um, I guess one thing that you guys didn't say is that, uh, look, this wasn't forced on the, the woman had a choice. Like, look, there is in the first place, there was a waiting period. I think it was about a month. They couldn't touch the women. They couldn't do anything with them. And ultimately they could only be taken on in marriage. There was no rape or anything like that. Plundering. That's just total BS. Um, it was a vol and it was voluntary on the part of the woman. She didn't have to agree to be married, but this was a, a necessary step to protect the society in the context of pagans who will, you know, if they're just left on their own, they're going to come back and destroy Israel and, and, you know, get vengeance on Israel and stuff. So they had to have some way of showing mercy to the people left over to the women and children and incorporate them and assimilate them properly into the society and again it was voluntary they took time they gave them that one month period so they could break off their uh sinful connections to their past and you know have a fresh start so to speak so it wasn't instantaneous it wasn't stealing against their will or plundering these women and children and stuff like that it was a voluntary assimilation and incorporation into the society as a form of mercy because otherwise, 
you know, it's they've got to do what they got to do in war to protect themselves. And here's another thing that uh, the last Fry put out. Also, women, I'm, I'm going to focus on the last uh, uh, um, point. Also, women on their own didn't have much of a choice at all. You're right. It was a harsh, it was a harsh, it was a harsh time. It was a harsh uh, um, thing. However, the mercy is, is that they were incorporated into their society. Okay. In other words, landowners would have to take care of them in some way, shape, or form. They would have to allow them to even pick from their harvest. So, and that, that depletes um, stuff for the family there. So the fact is they treated these people as their own at that point. They incorporated them into their society. Um, another thing that I, that I wanted to, to point out here is, yeah, war is a bad thing, you know, um, but Israel also had to, give warning to these guys before they attacked them and you see that all throughout you know there was there was a waiting period a a time of okay these guys are coming um get out get out of the uh um get out of the city or stay you stay and you fight then i'm sorry you're in war at that point and you're probably gonna die <laughs> there's so, one thing per Peraspa says this that i want to respond i think these stories make the most sense as mytho history, fables, and tribal propaganda. So emphasis on most sense. In, in what sense are you talking about most sense here? Because uh, are you talking about from a modern moral sensibility standpoint? You we you would prefer that these are just fables and trial propaganda? Or are you talking about most sense just sec as a secular historian? Because as a secular historian, we look, the ancient Near East, uh, as David has been saying, is it wasn't a pretty place. It was a brutal time in which to live. And God had to work with these Iron Age people and their primitive assumptions and worldviews and work with them. And that's the amazing thing is how he worked with them. He didn't compromise on the essentials, but he used their false assumptions, their, their, you know, their brutal way of life, and he redeemed it. He helped to transform them slowly, slowly and surely. Um, and to bring about salvation history. So, yeah, look, from a secular historic, I, I, I don't see any reason to say mo most sense to just assume these things didn't happen. I think it makes most sense to say, yeah, that these were brutal times. The human beings were, were sinful. They were devoid of the permanent presence of the Holy Spirit. And, um, yeah, they were carried away by their sin, sinful lusts, desires, and hates, and, and sins, and everything like that. So it's just historical facts that, these were brutal times. Um, but yeah, if you mean most sense by moral stuff, I hope what I'm saying is that, look, I think the moral thing to do is for God to try and save human beings. And in order to do that, he has to get his, he has to get his hands messy. He has to reach into and reach people where they are. And unfortunately, they were living in these brutal times. So he had to plunge in there and yank them out of it. And get them out of that step by step to bring about, you know, Jesus on the cross. You know, a, a, another thing is is that we often judge these ancient cultures harshly as well, right? Um, and the the problem is with that. I mean, you, in Star Trek, you have a, a a prime directive. You have an advanced civilization that's so far advanced than another civilization that it's coming to that they they're not allowed to interfere, right? Why? Because you don't put a two-year-old behind the seat of a uh, of of the uh, the driver's seat of a car. You know that's dangerous. You have to, like Dale says, you have to work people with people where they're at. You can't just give all the advanced technology to a a a um, um, primitive culture that wouldn't even know how to use it. You know, humanity is on an exploration. At this point, they're on a, a path of discovery and they have to learn. They have to grow. God can't just do everything for them. We wouldn't know what to do at that point. We wouldn't even grow. We wouldn't gain the knowledge we needed to to be able to be the civilization we are today. Even So just as as it's it's wrong for for I think for God to uh, be the divine butler, everybody wants him to be. I think that's wrong. You know, um, I think it's wrong to push on to so, uh, a society something that it's not ready for. 
You know, God has to meet them where they're at. They all said it perfectly. He has to meet them where they're at and help them grow, help them grow, <laughs> you know, instead of doing everything for them. Right. So let's continue on. As plunder. The Bible also says that you should be stoned to death if you accidentally work on a Saturday. I'm going to give this one to Dale. Sure. Uh, so the first thing that popped up, accidentally? No. Right? Actually, most of these crimes are for purposefully, explicitly for purposefully working. I mean, the guy that picked up sticks, that wasn't an accident. Uh, that was a purposeful act of rebellion. And that's, it was the rebellion aspect, right? You're rebelling against God, his covenant, the Sabbath, and and stuff like that. Um, it was, it's much more serious than just, oh, I, I, you know, I jaywalked. I broke a law today. Oops, I'm getting stoned. Uh, no, it, look, picking up picking up sticks. I, I, Michael, I, I played a clip in my Eastern Orthodox refutation video from Michael Brown, where he he attacks um, Jew, the Jewish Pharisees of Jesus' day, and rightly so, getting, you know, oh my gosh, I, it's, it's Saturday. You know, I can't comb my hair to the left. It's got to be to the right. And uh, now, you know, can I pick up how many pounds can I pick up before I, that counts as work? As work? Um, well, maybe if I attach a scarf, that'll make a difference. All of these stupid human trivialities, petty uh, foolishness, that's not what the law was about. The Sabbath was for us, for human beings, to give us a rest. My gosh, we need that in this day and age. I, you know, like, <laughs> if companies had their way today, we would be working seven days a week, 24-7, you know, kind of thing. We... Human beings, we need that rest. We need that break. Uh, so the Sabbath is for us, uh, not Sabbath for the, um, how does Jesus phrase it? Man, Sabbath is for man. Man is not for the Sabbath. But, you know, unfortunately, people get these traditions reversed and, and get it wrong. And that's where it leads to problems. And that's what this person is having a misunderstanding as that, you know, look, stoning to death just because you pick up a stick god couldn't care less about that it was that intentional act of re purposeful rebellion rebellious disobedience that can't be tolerated that will especially in this early barbaric primitive time that would rip apart the society of israel that had to be dealt with it had to be eliminated for the protection of salvation history if that guy wasn't killed every one of us would be going to hell today uh that stick picker upper he needed to go. That it was that serious. So. Yeah, Dale, Dale, you said something earlier too, and I'm just gonna piggyback off of, of this. Is that um, the 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 idea of volunteerism? Right? They didn't have to be in this covenant community. They didn't. But if they chose to be in that covenant community, they needed to obey those laws. Um. Josh, anything else on that one? Uh, yeah, I was going to say actually that the the intent, as as Dale was saying, the intent of the the Sabbath was actually so that man would rest. And the reason that man would rest on the seventh day is because of the Genesis account of God creating, and on the seventh day he rested. When he made man, he made explicit that what he was doing was making an image, a formed idol of himself that he would place in the earth to represent him. And man was to do what God does. And so man's to rest on the seventh day. Like Dale said, this is it's, it's willful disobedience and rebellion, but it's also an overt failure to image God properly. Which, to be honest with you, if I were to define sin in the broadest but most particular sense I could manage, it would be anything that fails to image God properly or deviates from divine intent is sin. And so not resting on the Sabbath on the seventh day when God gave man this explicit commandment to this covenant people, and these covenant people, like you said, are willfully engaging with this covenant. He knows that this is what they're doing. They know that this is what they're doing. It's been communicated to them very specifically. They, they, re they would repeat these commandments, by the way, this wasn't like a you get a debriefing one time when you're a kid and then you got to remember it forever. This was part of their lives. They knew this information. This would have been repeated to them and they had Sabbath prayers. There were preparations. Like Sabbath was a big deal. 
right? It wasn't just merely like, I'm going to lay on my couch and play video games. Like there was actually a process of what you would do with your family prior to Sabbath so that Sabbath could be what it was. That's why, that's why when, but when Friday night came about, it was a big deal because all of the things that were necessary for that had already taken place. And now they can engage with the Sabbath as this, this special thing. And we often think because of mere repetition, that something that is special is ceasing to be special because of how often it occurs. We do this all the time and we say, it's just this, it's just that. And our weird reductionistic game takes away the meaning of something, right? So what, when, when God told them, this is the Sabbath day, this is designated for your rest. This is along with, uh, this is along with also thou shall not make graven images of the Lord, your God. Why? Because God had already made images of himself, hence the law to you, right? That's where all of this kind of ties together is we're made in the image of God. Now the question obviously comes up and I think last Friday just asked it, are you guys working tomorrow? What about Saturday now? We are in a new covenant now. This new covenant here is not merely the repetition of the weekly cycle. It's become a cosmic, holistic covenant where Christ is the rightful owner operator of all reality. And now we get to participate in the divine life through him and in him. We are remade as new imagers by the very image of God, the perfected expression of God. According to Hebrews, he is the exact expression of the father and the glory of God, right? Like that's who Christ is. That's what he is. He's the fulfillment of the law in and for us. So when we have him and he has us, and we're now in a covenant relationship with the fulfillment of Torah, we now are in the rest of God. Christ is the Sabbath rest for us. We get to participate in that specialness of that day permanently. And the promise of this covenant is that we live as long as he does, which is forever, right? Now we can be eternal in him because he has raised up. And it's like all of these things are deeply rooted in the bigger picture that has to be conveniently ignored to make these things sound as absurd. Also want to... Uh maybe comment on this too an all-powerful all-benevolent god doesn't make sense to me in the context of these stories or any part of human history it's all too brutal and the supposed help is applied chaotically innately yeah. how, how do you how do you want god to respond to free agents that have the ability to either obey or disobey you right how much is he supposed to I, I mean it's not a his help isn't applied chaotically you can see it all throughout human history um th that's what the bible's proof of is that he led us in this 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 path the whole way and he intervened but another thing is you've got to remember that god's not just all powerful he's not just benevolent all benevolent he's also all just and he does judge and he does deal with agents that have the freedom of the will dale do you uh, i know you were yeah say something. yeah so that those were the two points i wanted to make is that look an all-powerful all-benevolent uh being all power doesn't give god the there is no such thing it's illogical and irrational to suppose that there is a power to determine a free will creature to do something so no, free will creatures are an essential part of the redemption and salvation process. God needs us as human beings to freely choose to participate in that process. So God's omnipotence has nothing to do with anything. He has to compromise to, you know, work with human beings where they are. As And what David said was absolutely right. Is it applied chaotically? Absolutely not. Um, you know, Molinism proves this. It is applied perfectly providentially perfectly there is another question up somewhere up there above i don't know where but it jesus uh god applies it uh yeah why not sooner why or why not later god applies it at the exact moment that it is gonna lead to the end result of saving as many free will creatures as possible that's the end goal and everything god does at that specific time is all playing a role and will lead up 
to that result. If anything had changed, you know, if Jesus had come 3,000 years ago, less souls would have been saved. Jesus came 2,050 years ago, less souls would have been saved. If I ate a, if I ate a cookie today for breakfast, less souls would have been saved. So as a Molinist, everything, everything works together for God's ultimate purpose of saving as many souls as possible. And that process inherently involves free will creatures. And that means God is forced to work with us where we're at and stuff like that. And to providentially intervene when his omniscience and middle knowledge tells him is the right moment to achieve that, that maximal goal that he has as a maximally great being. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say about that. All right, let's continue on. Saturday. The Bible also says that unless you hate your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, and yourself, you can't serve Jesus. Josh? Oh, boy. that The word hate is what is the sticky situation there. The word hate is a silly translation of the word that's there. And what it should mean is unless you properly orient your values in these people to be subordinate to your value of God. In other words, unless you love them less, which is, by the way, part of the main commandment that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all yours, not some, not the leftovers that you have after you've given your family the most of you or your friends or any other part of the community or even yourself. You are to give the highest portion of yourself to God. And through that, you are going to love your community properly. And this is the way that uh, that Augustine would call the disordered goods. If you have a good that you treat as the good, and it is not the good, that good that you treat as the good will quickly not be good, and it'll become demonic, and it'll become a god to you. You will sacrifice things to it. That's what right. you will do. And so having the wrong orientation toward others when you have a wrong orientation toward God is inevitable. I think you said that perfectly. Uh, Dale? Yeah, so I, okay, so what was the obje objection here? Something about we we hate. So first of all, hate, hating I, your father and mother and all that. Oh, I, I absolutely hate David Russell. So I mean that it's okay. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that obviously, look, this is um, a language trying to stress that that juxtaposition, right? Between you have to have your priorities straight, as Josh was saying. You've got to love God at all expense. By contrast. You know, if, if loving your brother interferes with you loving Christ and following Jesus or something like that, then you should hate your brother by comparison. It's not literally telling us to hate people. Yeah, right? as we're supposed and, to love uh, our neighbors ourself. <laughs> now, lay down our life for our friends. <laughs> now, I, I will speak as a skeptic, and I, I'm interested in your guys' take. Is this because in the Old Testament, it does say that God literally hates. You know, the, the notion that God just hates sinner, uh, sin, the sin and not the sinner, that's not true. I think in Proverbs, I, I forget where it is, it does say God actually hates sinners, liars, and, and stuff like that. Um, so, like, how, yeah, how would you guys reconcile that? Because it also, the Bible's also clear God loves all the sinners as well. So, how can both those things be true? And I, I'm, I struggle with this myself, so I don't have a good answer. I, I'm interested in your guys' take. How do how would that apply to us as Christians? Are we to love and hate people in the same way uh, that God does? Like, yeah, what's your guys' take on that? I think that that is something that comes very closely tied to what I was talking about before with the law being the reason for the law being that covenant with God so that we would rightly image him. And God hates false images. God loves the proper image, which is the potential of the person to be exactly what they were designed to be, which is why God would love them. God, and give himself for them and to them that they would become what he entail, what he intends for them to be. And God's intent is for that potential to become a representation of God in finality, eternality, right? Like a permanent uh, 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 relationship with God as a proper imager of God. And when we improperly image God, we become something that is not only a false image of him, it's a false version of ourselves. And I think that's what it means for God to hate the sinner when they become identified as the sin, the thief, right? 
the liar, the wicked. These are, yeah, the wicked. These are identity markers that God is giving to these people because they have deviated from the image to where they're not even the self that he made them to be. And I think that's what he's talking about ultimately is this disdain for the false image that they have become because whatever it is that you're following, whatever it is that you emulate and imitate, you become. That's the power of worship is becoming. And Josh, so, that fits, and Dale, I mean, that fits so in line with the nature of Proverbs and Psalms where it says those things. Why? Because they're mm -hmm. true isms, right? They're true isms, mm -hmm. and that's how you're supposed to take them. You know, um, that that image is that corrupted, that they become identified as the wicked. So that's, I, I would, I would concur. And that, and that doesn't apply to any real person, at least on this life, because we're always, there's always a 1% chance of redeemability, I guess. I'm, yeah. I'm it's it, but in that truism, it's not saying that God, it, it's like, you know, God hates Esau, but loves Jacob. Right. Yeah. Well, we know that God still took care of Esau. <laughs> he didn't like hate the guy, you know, but it was what Esau did. It was divorcing his, 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 what he was supposed to be. You know, Gosh. that's, that's what God, God hates in reality, you know, describing it as such, like in a truism, such as we get in the Psalms and stuff is exactly what Josh is pointing to. But also it's the case that it, it, like when Romans 9 quotes from Malachi, Jacob, I have loved Esau, I've hated Esau is a reference to the nation of Edom. Yeah, absolutely. Who had violated the covenant that that is they would God would bless whoever blesses Israel, whoever curses them, God would curse. They went against Israel and they received what the covenant brought about because God right. is true to his word. Right? right. And so that is a completely different context than God talking about individuals who perform sin and right. God having disdain for the what they've become in that. I think that that's ultimately what he's talking about, though, is the disordered state of somebody who falsely images God becoming something that is actually false. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank, thanks for your answer. Yeah. Because that that Proverbs verse has always been a thorn in my side. So, like, yeah, thanks for your for your guys answers there. Mm -hmm work on a Saturday. The Bible also says that unless you hate your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, and yourself, you can't serve Jesus. The Bible also says that if you look at someone with lust, you should rip out your own eyes. <laughs> Again, you know, I guess she thinks that Jesus is a loaf of bread too because he is, uh, you know, or an oak door because he's the door and and he's the bread of life and, and stuff like this. No, he's, he is communicating the gravity of sin and the fact that you're, you know, it's better for you to rip out the sin. What's causing the sin, mm -hmm. what is causing you to be tempted of it and enter heaven that way, than go to hell with both eyes. Okay. And to reject him, you know, that's what that is saying. I mean, it's clear, it's plain and simple. It, 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 that doesn't even take me having to do much digging historically or anything to understand the literacy of the times there. You know, Jesus used hyperbole. So does every other author. Get over it. <laughs> you want it to be literal because you want to make accusations against it. That's what, what it comes down to. in English was. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> just out of curiosity, the hyperliteralness. <laughs> <laughs> well here hold on even if jesus was being literal does it not does it not actually like communicate something really particular about the way that jesus sees humans and identity like you are you you have a body you are your body also but it would be better for you to lose part of your body than to lose your identity to hell it would be better for you to be permanently damaged in your body than to lose your whole self in separation from God. That makes so much sense. And the fact that we would even have to try to explain it away is missing the point. He, he could be actually being literal. And it's not the point that you're supposed to perform some kind of hack job alley surgery on yourself or whatever. The point is sin is deadly not just to your body, but to your whole self. And it's like gangrene. It is better for you to cut off your hand than to rot the entire way. Right. Dale, anything else? 
Uh, no, I think, uh, like I said, I fully agreed with what you what you guys were saying on that front. So I have nothing to add. Yeah, I think it's the Bible it's also obvious. says that if someone steals from you, you should give them more things to steal from you. The Bible also says that if somebody is attacking you, to let them continue attack attacking you. Don't fight back. <laughs> Again, this is awesome. <laughs> They get sillier and sillier on this one, but you know, oh, you do have man. pacifists that won't fight, you know, uh, as, uh, I was talking to Dale, I think this week about, uh, uh, the early church and pacifism and stuff like that, that there was some of that going around. Um, but if you do a careful examination of the text, uh, you know, self-defense is not what is being applied here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a certain context and a certain group that he's speaking to, and there's certain words he's using, like if you get challenged, you know, um, or if you're being persecuted for my sake, they're not persecuting you, they're persecuting him in a way, you know, because of his teachings, right? So these are things you can easily deduce from the text if you just study it. You know, it's simple study. Um, I can't remember what the other one was, uh, Oh, the stealing. If they if keep letting them steal from you, um, I I I don't know, man. Josh, what do you think on that she, one? That was that's what got me. That's what made me laugh. She said, "If somebody steals from you, you should give them more stuff to steal from." Look, if I give you stuff and you accept it, you're not stealing from me, <laughs> right? So this is an approach to extreme mercy. As a response, notice that what Jesus is doing is getting you as far as possible, even to a comical extreme, as far as possible away from immediate reaction to how you think you should be in a situation. He says, no, you're not only wrong, you're exactly opposite wrong. When somebody steals from you, you don't come after them. You show your generosity that shows them to be a fool. Because why would they steal from you? You would have given it to them should they just ask. And even if they did steal, here's even more mercy for me to give to you. Like these are these are parodies of human corruption being flipped on their head so that Jesus can show you just how good goodness actually is. And we sit here and go, oh, well, that just sounds like you're getting took. Like, yeah, guess what? Courageous people learn how to trust and extend themselves out and often that is mistaken as weakness and naivety. But you know what? If you've been burned enough times, you know how expensive trust is. And it is brave to trust and extend yourself to someone and actually offer yourself to somebody as a help. It's very difficult to deliver on that. And when you do that to people that love you, that's wonderful. But when you do that to people who actively dislike and even try to harm you in one way or another or do evil to you, you are representing God in a much deeper sense. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a privilege that he's trying to describe for you to be an extreme. You're no longer a microcosm of the culture at that point either. You're actually making an impact. Right. Exactly. Right. You know, yeah. You're, 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 you're doing something on a macro scale there that's going to uh, uh, live on in somebody else and it's going to spread. I, I totally agree with what you guys are saying. Well, one thing she mentioned was, you know, turning the other cheek as well as, as this kind of a, in the same vein as an example. So I just wanted to read from this scholar here. So the demand to turn the other cheek isn't a summons to avoid defending your family or defending yourself when you are threatened. When we compare Jesus' teaching to the situation described in the Mishnah, it's clear that he's referring to legal retaliation. He refers to a backhanded slap. Um uh, on the right cheek, most people, it's assumed, the Bible assumes most people are right-handed, right? Um, that called for double the compensation of other strikes because it was a gesture of disrespect when you had a backhanded slap as opposed to slapping someone front frontwards, right? Um, Yeshua gives his followers a higher standard, even when they have the legal right to exempt payment. You know, don't just be vengeful and say, hey, you, how dare you disrespect? And I'll, I'll admit, uh, you know, sometimes I fail this myself, right? Such as with the ortho bros and stuff. Sometimes you do, um, get, you know, you backhanded me. Okay, fine. I'm going to give you a dose of your own and stuff like that. Jesus is saying that's the wrong attitude. Don't, don't, 
you know, seek retribution and stuff like that. Um, if somebody backslaps you and that's an act of disrespect, you're, you're obviously not going to be seriously hurt from just a backslap, but it's talking about in this context of the legal remedies, you, you could go after them for double if they dared backslap you, you know, slapping you just frontwards. Okay, sure, that hurt, they hurt you, but they, they were still respectful towards you. But when you back and someone that was that gesture of disrespect and this was an honor and shame society at this time so that's why the law said oh my gosh somebody dares do that you go after them twice and you get double that punishment on these people uh jesus is, is saying no that's not the way we we should think don't be vengeful don't be wanting retribution don't worry about your honor and shame it's that's all pettiness you know we we love each other be forgiving and and merciful and stuff like that. Um, that That's the point of these things. It's not saying literally like, oh yeah, let someone beat the living heck out of you and just sit there and be like, oh, this is great, yeah. Is that uh, all you got? <laughs> that, that all you got? My, you know, my wife's over there, go after her next. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> all right, here's here's the last one, guys. I promise we're almost done. Hacking you, don't fight back. The Bible also says happy is the one who takes your infants and dashes their skulls into rocks. So why again should I care what the Bible says? That was the last one. Uh, wow. Yeah, David did say uh, happy is the guy uh, uh, that does this. He's he, obviously it, it's not uh, a command of God in this in this uh, aspect and not what God wants. Um, so, it, I mean, I don't know where she was getting at with that one. I don't know if you have the psalm, but it, it, I, I remember what, looking at the whole context. What, of this. what was it? Psalm 139? 137. 7, One, 137. 137. Yeah. It's like the end, like the almost at the end. Um, but basically he's talking about like, uh, like war again, yeah. you know, and like uh, battles and, and how much he basically detests this enemy and stuff like that so has something to do with that dale did you look into that one i got it right here I, so you I got, didn't, no. yeah, it's, it looks like it's talking about israel going to war with babylon or something and it's talking about like you know hype hyperbolic language again wartime hyperbolic language is is, um, is typical it, it is the norm it's the thing you do in ancient near eastern warfare right and um that's what's going on here yeah like you know, they're not literally saying like, yeah, you know, taking joy and celebrating, smashing little babies against the rocks and stuff like that. It's it's just saying like, hey, like we totally annihilated these bad guys coming after us and we fought for the Lord and we won. It, it's wartime hyperbolic language like, yeah, we smashed them. We got them good. You know, like it's the same way we talk in sports and stuff like that. Um, you know, we obliterated the. What, David's a hockey fan. What is your the Capitals? Uh, yeah, the yeah, like the, the Canadian, the Toronto Maple Leafs just slaughtered those buggers. You know, we smashed <laughs> the, the the Capitals' heads against the the boards and stuff, right? So that's that's what this is. Literal. It's not meant to be literal. It's purely hyperbolic. I mean, it's it's in the Psalms, which is poetry, a poetic genre and stuff. And it's clear what this is. It. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely clear and why obviously god was known to command the killing of infants i don't know what version of the bible she was reading on that but it from my knowledge god punished uh, uh people for killing infants all the time matter of fact mm -hmm. one of the biggest reasons the canaanites were judged were because of their infant sacrifices another mm -hmm. one was that uh um uh herod how he died Due to uh, the 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 crying of Rachel, the the mass murder in Bethlehem, I mean, dude exploded with worms. God worms. literally, literally, in you know, judged him by putting worms and basically killing him that way because it's so detestable to God. So I don't know what version of the Bible you're reading there, but it, there's never a time where God said it was okay to kill the infants. Never. Matter of fact, he says, if you keep them from me, it's like tying a millstone around your own neck and yep. into uh, a deep pond. So, yeah, I don't I, I mean, that's not uh, um, even. Uh, and no, it wasn't required to kill the Canaanites children as we just went over about incorporating women and children into 
uh, the thing. Again, you, you can't when it when when you see those poetic language, it's very easy to see where it's telling you to where where it, the command is. You know, hey, wipe them out to the last man, man, woman, and child. These are part of Hebrew poetry and decimation language. Like Dale just you know gave you a, a prime example in the realm of hockey like the canadians crushed the capitals or decimated them and slaughtered them you know they they use those terms just like we use them today yeah one thing i wanted so is it okay to use this hype is that immoral in itself using this wartime hyperbolic language like this and i would say absolutely i see nothing wrong with it so long as there is a reasonable expectation that the audience will understand it and obviously in this context everyone understood it if anything it would be in a more of an objection well what about confusing people like you the last friday uh, and stuff like that today well i in that case i would argue look there, there is a reasonable expectation that you are a real seeker and you can easily discover the ancient near eastern context and see that wartime hyperbolic language is, is prevalent in every out in the Bible and outside the Bible. This is just the way people talk by back then. So I don't think it would be unduly confusing for people back then, nor for us today. If you are a reasonable real seeker and you actually take take a couple of days to just research online, this will be easy for you to discover. So absolutely hyperbolic language like this is a okay. There's nothing immoral about it at all, in my opinion. And what about God drowning the world with babies in it? Nothing immoral about that either. That was how we, uh, that's how we save as many souls as possible. So yeah, I would even have a different approach. I would like to, to know where in the text is said that the babies were included. I, I think that, I think that there, a lot of people assume not. generally that that's happened, but if there was a corruption in, in, in the line somewhere mm -hmm. and there were only, if those babies were righteous, right, God would have got them out or saved them, okay, if there were babies at that time. We don't know the state of the world pre-flood. We don't. That's so I don't, I'm not going to assume that on, on that basis. I also am not going to be naive enough to say, look, um, um, God has a right to take life when he wants to take life. He does have a right to do that. OK, if there was things going on where there was like no rain on the world, I can see that there's pe the people at that point were not having babies. I, I, I agree with uh, the skeptics. I, I agree. I think that that's weak. Um, I, I just think that the most probable thing is that there were at least some babies there. Everything would have been normal and. If that's the case, there would have been at least some babies in there. But I've heard the argument. It's not ridiculous what you're saying. Like, I, I, I've heard some people make that argument. Um, I just don't buy it myself. But cool. Josh? Well, I just I, I, I was going to jump back to the text and say this last uh, sentence here. when he says, happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. This is not a prescriptive text of God giving directive to man to do this because it's the right thing to do. This is David writing in both triumph and resentment about an enemy that was overcome. And so even if it was literal, again, it really doesn't say much about the Bible, about God. It says a lot about David and David's own personal prerogative when it came to his enemies. But again, he doesn't have David is in, let's call it an inconvenient time in history prior to the cross and was also in a, in a state where, let's say he, as king or even prior to that, war was a prevalent part of all of their lives. And people that grow up in war are probably more adverse to the effects of war than people who have grown up never seeing one on their own soil. I am privileged enough to never have seen a war on my soil, in my community, anywhere in my life at all. I'm incredibly privileged. And so I really don't have a internal conception of what it would be like for me emotionally or perceptively to experience the victory, a vast victory over an enemy 
and then write poetry of worship before the Lord because of that victory being delivered into your hands and me include part of my feeling of victory and resentment as the closer for my worship. Are all of my prayers just as perfect as the Bible? No, because they're coming from me. And I think we should extend the same grace to David as he's writing a worshipful poem for the Lord. This isn't prophecy. So bottom line, Canadians kicked David's Americans David's butts. muted. Oh yeah. And the whole thing, the whole thing about uh the babies drowning and stuff like that, and this and that, that God would do that. God deemed that the whole face of mankind, every single person, except for one family, was wicked to the point that it was time for them to be judged. Okay. So no matter what view, the, the burden of proof is on you. To prove to me that babies were in that when the text doesn't even mention it. I well, don't I mean, think God wipes out the innocent in that way. So and, and even if but here's the thing, David, even if he did, we have two things that strike in favor of this actually not being a problem to begin with. One right. being God's prerogative to give and take life. Like that's sufficient in itself to say God could take the life of anyone. Like, let's say David's uh, um, a bastard child with Bathsheba, right? Mm -hmm. And then David has the same thing. Lord, this is your jurisdiction. But one thing that he added, the comfort that I'll see this child again, because God does not send babies to judgment. Right. The yeah, and they're not God only God belongs that. to such as these. Yeah, and I, I was just making a burden of proof uh, uh, uh um, claim there as well, but also to the fact that, yeah, I mean, what about the the angel of death over Egypt? You know, the firstborn, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you, you know, God does judge, and He does take life. You're just gonna have to get over that. He does it every day. Babies die every day, every single day. Uh, they're stillborn. Now, our mortality rates are a lot better uh, when it comes to infant mortality, but God does take people's lives. That's His prerogative. And when he decides that there's there's judgment, he knows the future, he knows what's best, and he makes that judgment. Sorry. Last thing I'll say just very quickly. I, I do agree totally with what David said on the burden of proof that, yeah, it, the burden of proof is on the skeptic who's claiming, number one, that there were babies. I Obviously, I think that there can be a good just kind of common sense statistical argument on that front that there probably was. Um, but also beyond that, you also have to prove that there's something immoral going on here. And as Josh said, there, there are many obstacles to overcome before you can establish that burden of proof. I don't, I do not see anything immoral, even if babies are innocent, let's assume they're innocent kind of thing, which I think I would. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. I, and I've come up with examples that secular atheists like David Smalley, when I was on his show, would agree. Yeah, there are circumstances where it is morally permissible to kill innocent babies, such as, in, such as a, a, you know, a nine-month-year-old pregnant woman who's holding a gun and about to shoot and kill a little five-year-old kid, but I can stop her by shooting and killing her. And, and by doing so, Let's say the circumstances are that she's pregnant, her baby will die. There's no way to save it and stuff. And I know this in advance. I would kill her and her baby, unborn baby, to save that five-year-old kid in those circumstances. And yet the, that baby is innocent in the womb. It did nothing wrong. But that's morally permissible. Um, there's nothing immoral about what I did in killing those people. Well, you know, guys, you know, just to close this out, because uh, we are now at the end. I appreciate you guys for coming on. Dale from Real Seekers came on. Um, guys, we got some treats coming up for you. We got William Lane Craig in two weeks. That is going to be on Faith Unaltered and Real Seekers. That is exciting. Um, Craig is one of the best apologists that have ever existed, in my uh, opinion. Um, but <laughs> yeah, he has a, he has uh, impacted my faith to such a degree that I am sitting where I am today um, because of it. Um, I was uh, glad we got, we we've got more problem of evil stuff coming up. Uh, I got Clay Jones who wrote a book on it. And I'll show you the, the clip here. Yeah. Why does God allow evil? 
So we'll have that coming up for you guys. Dale, you were saying about to say something, and uh, I cut you no, off. I, accident. No, I was just, I was joking around. Like, I, yeah, I was glad he, he uh, finally, William Craig finally answered my email. That's all I was saying. I was being funny. Right on, right <laughs> on. Um, Josh, you got Cosmic Corner coming up. Yep, next the week, and talk thing. about self sacrifice and how the cross changed the hero stories and our imaginations forever. Uh-huh. April nineteenth. Right That's a on. special day. Very special day. It's the day yep. that the D A L E was born. So D-A-L-E. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy really? birthday, D A L E. Thank you. Thank you. All but uh, right. But yeah, you forgot uh the next show we have on Faith on Alter Dam Real Seekers is actually on Tuesday, April sixteenth. We've been advertising yep. for a while. Barbara mm. with the psychic. That's right. And it's a grill a Christian episode. Me and Tyler are gonna get grilled like crazy. Um, she showed me what she wants to talk about. So yeah, it's everything Christian exclusivity, the morality of hell beyond that. Uh, she did an inter. She's a psychic. So she claims to have done an interview with Jesus. It is f- full of a bunch of stuff. I yeah. and Tyler are going to disagree with. So she wants oh, to discuss cool. that and I'm going to be raising objections. What'd you say, yeah. David? It, we got, we're chalk full. I think that uh, actually goes well with uh, this whole deconstruction thing too. And what she's going to be asking you guys, um, because that's a lot of stuff they bring up as well. Um, and I'm going to continue on this with the deconstruction and stuff like that. Those that were Christians that decided to deconstruct from faith. We'll do some more videos on that, we're, but I'm also going to be switching it up. So I'm just not going to pick on deconstructionists. I promise. I'm actually going to pick on some of the wild claims you get to that, that, uh, uh, turn into memes that people take for granted and think it's true. Uh, but no, we're going to be dealing with the wild claims that people make as well on the, on the internet. And uh, we'll have fun. We're gauging the culture here. And that's what we do at Faith Unaltered. When you not only talk about theology, but we engage the culture, we engage what's going on. And um, yeah, that's what we do. Um, anybody else got any, any closing words? Um, I, I kind of announced my, yeah, my next show on real seekers is, is that Barbara with one, um, outside of that, I, I will be going back on Kevin non Tradicath's channel on April 22nd at six 30, uh, to continue our discussion. He's a non-religious agnostic, but you know, very knowledgeable and that sort of thing. I saw he, he left a comment on our, on our show with Dr. Robert's son, Jenis earlier today. So yeah, he's. One of the one of the good ones who's a, an unbeliever. So I'm hoping to bring him to the faiths, uh, so, you know, slowly but surely. Right on. All right, guys. Well, as Tyler would tell you, be safe, have a good night, and stay like Christ.